We're sticking to finance. Have you ever wanted to trade uh, and have almost zero commissions and transparency? I bet that people that do trade would love this and do love this. Um, like many of us, or the other way around, in 2008, when the financial crisis hit us, uh, they managed to build up a one million person waitlist, a waitlist on which I was also, and maybe one of you folks were also there, um, and that was a huge thing. They were, it was a waitlist to test the app that they wanted to ship. Uh, so they're saying that FinTech is here to stay, um, and we will find out in our next session. So please put your hands together for the co-founder and co-CEO of Robinhood app and Laura Shin Forbes contributor. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this fireside chat. Um, so just to get a quick read of the audience, how many of you are already familiar with what Robinhood does? OK. Wow. So um, we're going to have Vlad explain it. And I'll just tell you briefly, it's a free stock trading app. But why don't you um, give an overview for the people who, who aren't familiar? Sure. Uh, so Robinhood is, simply put, the best way to buy and sell stocks from your smartphone. It's uh, commission free, whereas most of our competitors charge anywhere from seven to $10 a trade. So it really unlocks uh, investing to a much larger group of people. Uh, those that are burdened by commissions and high account minimums and uh, the clumsy user interfaces of some of our competitors. And how did you come up with the idea for that? So we were uh, working on a previous company, my co-founder Beju and I, and the company was in trading technology. And through building that company, which sold trading software to banks and hedge funds, we realized something very significant. And that was that big banks and hedge funds don't pay trading commissions. They place millions of trades per day, and they can't really do that if each one costs $10. So behind the scenes, what's happened is the entire backend technology powering trading has gotten completely automated, is completely electronic. What you see in kind of 80s movies of people on the floor or the pit of the stock exchange uh, waving around these paper tickets. That's all completely for show. Uh, all of the action happens in data centers in New Jersey. So what's happened in the past 20 years, everything's gone completely electronic, but consumers are still paying the same prices that they were paying when things were done manually. So there's a huge opportunity to lower that burden and the cost on the consumer by building a modern brokerage from the ground up. And how did you get started? It's one thing to you know, have this great insight, but then to actually build like a trading company is. Yeah, there were a couple of insights, actually. One is just that it could theoretically be done. And this was incredibly non-obvious, because if you kind of looked at the market, you saw a bunch of really, really large competitors that had been around for decades. They were all charging basically the same thing, and not many new startups in the space. The other is just sort of the observation that people were doing more and more things on their smartphones, and the competitors weren't really there. So the discount brokerages weren't focusing on mobile and user experience the way some of the big social media companies were. So you can sort of marry these things and create not just a really, really compelling cost structure to consumers, but also a great product, one where one where you can sign up and buy your first stock right away, as opposed to waiting several weeks, as you would have had to do with, uh, with some of the incumbent competitors. So um, the way we actually ended up doing it, um, we thought it would be very simple. So we, we entered somewhat naive. We knew we understood a lot about trading technology and that some of the other stuff uh, would be easy to figure out as we went along. And I think that was actually a really, really helpful thing because if we, if we knew what we now know, which is that the whole process of servicing customers, onboarding, regulation is so important and so deep that in many ways it overwhelms the amount of work that, that we've spent on the trading side. Um, 
we might have been overwhelmed. But um, looking back, it's, it's quite amazing that we became the first finance company to win an Apple Design Award, the first to win a Google Design Award, really the first financial product that's regarded as being a great, well-designed, user-friendly product. And we didn't know any of that stuff at the beginning. We just had to build it up as we, as we went along. So let's dive a little bit more into those challenges that you mentioned. How, what were they and how did you overcome them? Well, one really big specific difference between launching a company like Robinhood and launching a just general consumer product company is you see entrepreneurs nowadays, they put up a landing page for a product that doesn't exist yet. Uh, if people take to it, they go and build it. If they don't, they like quietly dissolve it and then move on to the next thing. And Kickstarters also helped a lot with this in that you can just gauge how much people will like your product before even building it. So in our industry, that's not possible. You have to be regulated and approved by FINRA and the SEC before you even announce what you're doing publicly. That's why by the time we announced Robinhood and we had this wait list, um, actually a year and a half plus of work had gone into the business, getting all the licenses, getting all the approvals ready. And uh, it was very difficult to uh, get financing early on, convince people that they should be investors in the company because we didn't have that approval. So it's kind of the chicken and the egg problem, right? Um, you need the approval to show traction, but you also need investors to get that approval so they can fund this entity to convince the regulators that you can survive with customer accounts for a year. And in nowadays, the climate for investment is basically very, very difficult unless you can show some traction and that customers like your product. So, yeah, it was very uh, hard in the beginning. We had to uh, go up and down Sand Hill, pound on a lot of doors. We probably met with high dozens, if not hundreds of investors. Uh, to and what did you say to them to convince them to sign on during this long waiting period? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we tried everything. I think what ultimately worked was the fact that um, we were experienced entrepreneurs. We had a previous company. Um, we understood our space. And sort of getting investment is sort of like rolling a big snowball. So it gets somewhat easier when you get a couple. You know, you get your first two investors. You ask them, do they know any other investors? And then um, you just have to really, really persevere because at the beginning, it's like pushing a tiny little snowball. You never can imagine it getting to a, to a big enough size. But if you push for about a year and a half, two years, um, it can get quite big. And there was another obstacle you faced, which is that you had actually moved here from the Bay Area. So you were kind of like starting from zero. How did you um, build your network in that regard? Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's, uh, that made it tough for us. Um, I was in New York for my previous company. And we actually decided to move my previous company to the Bay Area because, uh, again, we were selling software to hedge funds, so it's much more of an engineering company. And my co-founder and I were both Stanford grads, so this was kind of home for us. This is where our, our networks were. So we moved that company back, back here, and we had to pretty much start from scratch. Uh, we were actually very, very lucky. Our first angel investor was someone we knew from New York who was in the trading industry and ended up moving to California at exactly the same time as us. Um, and we reconnected kind of spontaneously and you know, we're, we're able to get him involved uh, because he understood our space quite well. And uh, yeah, from then on, as I said, it's kind of getting the snowball and you know, having hundreds of conversations. And when you talk about that long period of like the initial ramp up with you know, the regulatory stuff and everything, like what, what did you do mentally to kind of keep going and to not give up? Yeah, that's kind of one of those things that I think can be very difficult for perhaps second time entrepreneurs or people that have had experience at larger companies before. Um, 
there could be quite, quite a time between when you get an idea and when you get sort of the first positive feedback that it's working. So for us, um, I've never really had a job at a big company. I hadn't really had a company that was super successful. So uh, just working on products, being an entrepreneur, um, working out of this little garage space we were in in Palo Alto, um, that was really, really exciting for me. So even back in the beginning, when in retrospect, we were obviously uh, not doing that well. I thought we were winning and making a ton of progress. So you almost have to, um, if you don't have that, you almost have to kind of uh, deceive yourself into thinking that you're always making progress and always winning. And you know, you talked very compellingly about how you know the software was doing all this, and so it really wasn't costing all that much that people were charging for the trades. But um, you know, these were like proven business models. So how were you so convinced that you could do the same thing with a leaner business model? Yeah. So uh, the benefit that that we have in our space is that a, a large number of our competitors, the big ones, are public companies. So you can tell kind of where the money comes from. And when you look at a discount brokerage, say an E-Trade or Charles Schwab, um, actually a relatively small portion of the revenue comes from commissions. Trading commissions, that's seven to $10 on every transaction, is maybe between 20 and 30% of the total revenue. So that puts it in a very interesting, that puts you in a very interesting position as a large incumbent because on the one hand, 20 to 30 percent is, um, is a very large number. I mean, these are companies that are worth tens of billions of dollars. So it's, it's very difficult to just eliminate that, right? And you saw when Schwab reduced their commissions by a few dollars per trade a couple of weeks ago, their stock immediately dropped by over 5%. So it hurts them pretty hard uh, if they had to lower them. On the other hand, it's only 30%. So you can kind of, if you have the benefit of starting from scratch and building a new company in the space, the question is, can we operate 30% more leanly? Can we grow 30% larger? And if you believe those two things, you know, um, their margin is our opportunity in a way. And I imagine that in this space, one of the bigger challenges also is trust. You know, people want to feel trust in their financial institutions. So how did you convince people to switch over to a startup for, you know, handling their money? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of the early conversations we had was with, um, with one of the founders of IDEO, David Kelly, um, who said a very, very interesting thing, which is that trust is basically no longer about having a large marble building um, on like a very expensive street, and is much more about saying exactly what you're, do, what you're gonna do as a product and delivering upon that. And, you know, that's how people trust products like Instagram and uh, other products that have almost no physical infrastructure and don't resemble sort of your typical idea of what a trusted company should be like. So rather than brick and mortar infrastructure or large buildings, uh, today's consumers look at things like customer reviews, the design and user experience of the product, um, whether what we're promising is what we end up delivering, which is uh, free trading with a very simple interface. And then we also have the benefit that our customers are a lot younger. You have the average, um, the average customer of a typical brokerage is in their 60s. The average Robinhood user is in their late 20s. So they're much more amenable to trying a new financial product um, and the stakes aren't quite as high for them. It's not like they have hundreds of thousands of dollars in retirement savings that they have to move over. A lot of these are first time investors that are starting out with hundreds or low thousands of dollars. And so you can't keep giving everything away free forever. So how do you make money? So in the fall, we rolled out uh, a product called Robinhood Gold, which starts at $10 a month. 
And it's a very unique product because uh, it sort of takes what people are very familiar with, which is uh, a subscription service that they have to pay uh, somewhere in the $10 a month range, and sort of transplants it into um, financial products, which hasn't been done uh, too many times before. And since the introduction, Robinhood goal has been um, insanely successful. So people are signing up in huge numbers, um, and it's, it's really turned into uh, a very special product for us. It's ex and, exceeded all of our expectations. And what did they get for the $10? So for, for $10 a month, and it um, increases as, uh, as people have more money in the account, they get uh, access to margin trading, uh, after hours trading, so you can trade for uh, 30 minutes before the open and a few hours after the close, which makes it really handy for people that want to trade around earnings releases. Um, and they also get access to uh, something called Robinhood Instant, which allows them to instantly access uh, deposits from their bank account. So if you deposit some capital from your bank account, you can use it to trade right away, even though the money takes some time to actually move between between the two institutions, and also uh, access to immediately using your funds after a, sa a sale of stock to buy more stock. And we anticipate adding more and more things to Robinhood Gold over time, so it's really uh, supposed to be the best of Robinhood rather than a very specific set of features. And what percentage of users have signed up for it? Uh, a large number. I can't give you uh, specific numbers now, but I can tell you that uh, it's increasing very, very quickly. And do you feel like amongst the universe of kind of all people that sign have signed up for a service like yours that you see different types of trading behavior on Robinhood than like an E-Trade might? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so the, the fact that we have no, minim no, no minimums and zero commissions definitely allows for different behaviors that you see on, uh, on other brokerages. For example, someone that's basically starting from zero and is a first-time investor is going to have a hard time using an E-Trade or a Schwab. They have high account minimums. They're charging 7 to $10 per trade. So every time you buy and sell, uh, you know, you're paying 15 to $20 which basically means in order for that to be negligible, your transaction has to be high hundreds or thousands of dollars. And a lot of people who are starting out don't have that. So we get a lot of those customers that would just be unable to buy stock elsewhere. So and in a way then, it's like your business model tapped into a market that existed that no one was, was exploiting. Is that kind of yeah, the way Yeah, precisely. Think? So those customers are underserved by other offerings. And then we also have customers that spend tens of thousands of dollars per year on trading commissions at, uh, at other brokerages. And for them, it's just a no-brainer to, uh, to move their business over to Robinhood because there's just like a very large dollar value associated with it. And those two groups uh, are very, very different. They're sort of polar opposites. And there's a whole spectrum in between uh, of people as well. And so let's um, get some of your kind of entrepreneurial advice. Um, fill in this blank. When I started Robinhood, I wish I had known. So um, one thing that a lot of people uh, sort of associate with entrepreneurship, if you think about people in your, in your head that are very successful, it's people that sort of do a lot of things. Maybe they have a lot of different things going on. Um, and I think that was my idea to begin with. I associated being successful with doing a lot of things simultaneously. And if I had known that actually it's much more important to do as few things as possible and do them really, really well, it would have served me much better. Uh, especially in the early days in, in New York. Um, you know, we had our software business, but we, we were always looking for uh, other things to do. Um, we had so many stupid ideas. At one point, we were even working on like a, a chat bot that would respond with a joke and you could have a little back and forth, which had nothing to do with finance, but we thought it was sort of this cool thing. 
and we kind of thought of what we were doing as building the next generation Bell Labs, uh, which was just another way of saying working on like hundreds of different projects at the same time. It wasn't until we realized that free trading, consumer products, very, very simple and focused, um, and we, we poured all of our energy into that, that we started to have sort of the kind of success that um, you would think of when you, when you think of people that are really successful. And when you had like all those different ideas and then narrowed it down, what, how did you narrow it? So there were, um, I mean, it wasn't a very direct process. I think, like I mentioned, we tried doing a bunch of things at the same time. And um, I think we, we, we had gotten the advice that we should focus and try to do fewer things. And uh, having a bunch of things work in a mediocre way, not really work, um, led us to kind of uh, very, very concretely decide that we would pick one thing to focus on. And I think the, when we started thinking about offering this product to consumers, it was so obvious in a way and so needed and something that all of us would use that we immediately sort of realized that this, this was something that should be brought into the world and we were the best group of people to actually do it. Great. Well, this has been such an illuminating discussion. Um, Vlad is actually holding a Q&A just down the street at Fox Forum at 3.30 if you want to join him. But otherwise, thank you. Thank you.